Welcome everybody back here to the Martin E. Siegel Theater Center at the Graduate Center CUNY in Manhattan in Midtown. It's again a, a beautiful day. We're having a fantastic uh, week uh, when it comes to weather. It's over 20 degrees here. People are out and um, and um, the city is full and with people. We had sad news here in the um, New York Theater World, the great Under the Radar Festival that's happening in January that brought people together globally, internationally. It looks like uh, um, that's taking a time out uh, for financial reasons, if I understand right. Um, a, a great hit in the stomach, I think, um, for New York Theater, Experimental Theater. Uh, so much happens in festivals. And um, we hope um, this will be just temporarily. And maybe perhaps, you know, one day there will be a summer festival possible or thinkable. We are trying to work on that, but uh, it's been a great uh, uh, contribution the festival did. And as someone said, I think Bob Wilson in his big play, you know, a tree is best measured when it's down. Sometimes one only knows the greatness of something when it's no longer there or has been has been cut. Um, with us today, we have a special guest uh, in our exploration of um, international global work for this theater, for performances of new forms, for the new times we live in, this mantra that we always um, repeat that Brecht said, that new times do need new forms of theater and we need innovations, we need to, um, um, to look with different fresh eyes, especially after the time of Corona, the time um, of COVID. And with us today, we have Andy Field, um, a great worker from the um, UK uh, and carried that switch, a uh, good friend of the center called and wrote that, Frank, you have to talk to Andy Field. And we always often you know, take serious what our friends and collaborators say. So we reached out to Andy. So Andy, here you are with us. How are you and where are you? Here I am. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for having me. Uh, I am currently in London, in the beautiful city of London. Uh, it is um, much like in New York. It's been, well, we're, we're 5.30 now, but it's been a beautiful day here. The sun has been shining. People have been out on the park. Uh, for people who know London, I am in the east end of London, just by the corner of a, of a beautiful park called Victoria Park uh, in, my, uh, in my small apartment where I live. And uh, yeah, all, all is good here. Really looking forward to talking with you. Great. It's about 5.30 in the afternoon, I think. So let me tell you a little bit about Andy. Andy Field is an artist, writer, and curator, and he's based, as he said, in London. And his performances uh, went around the world, and he specializes. He has this idea to create encounters between strangers. It is the, He's the co-director of the award-winning Forest Fringe Festival. We're going to talk about this, too, and a regular contributor to publications, including the great Guardian um, newspaper. Um, encounterism, as he calls it, is an interesting word, a very beautiful word actually, is a playful, analytic, and poetic exploration of the delight and transformative power of real life encounter. So Andy, tell us a little bit, what does it mean? What does it really mean? Encounterism. Mm -hmm. Yes, so I suppose, um, my interest in human encounters extends back many, many, many years into my um, into my, my my work as an artist. And um, this book, in some ways, is a culmination of the work I've been doing over the last ten years in in making art, art making, and theatre making. And in some ways, it's a complete departure. Um, I think that the so the word encounterism. What I wanted to do was to invite people to pay attention to these kind of very ordinary everyday human encounters, um, with the kind of concentration that I suppose we normally reserve for subjects that have an ism on the end of them. You know. Um, and so I think it's a, sort of a, just a little playful way of inviting people to think about the encounter as a form, as a maybe as an artistic form, as a social form, as a kind of phenomenon that exists within our lives and that perhaps is often too often overlooked. Uh, and that's uh, that's really what the book does is it tries to kind of really drill down into these 
sort of everyday human events. Um, show, with, show us the cover. Maybe hold it up. You know, it just came I'll, out, I'll right? I'll it for you here. Look, this is... Uh -huh. So, in fact, what I can do... I mean, I don't know if this is of interest to anybody other than people who work in publishing. But this is the, the US and this is the, the British, the UK. Uh -huh. Okay. There you go. Here so, we in go. the US... This is the one that people will be looking out for. But Who published I, I, it for you in the US? Uh, what's your It's problem? Norton. Norton, great. Mm -hmm. Norton. But I just was going to read, so to, in, in, sort of to, to follow up your, your question. The um, So the just at the very front, I've put this quote from Georges Perec, um, which is, uh, how should we take account of question, describe what happens every day and recurs every day? the banal, the quotidian, the obvious, the common, the ordinary, the infraordinary, the background noise, the habitual, to question the habitual, but that's just it. We're habituated to it. So that, 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 I thought that was a nice way of starting the book because that's, my, that's what I'm attempting to do in this book, Encounterism, and, and through this kind of focus on the, the everyday encounter is to, to drill down into the everyday and the habitual and render it in a in primary colors to hold it up to the light and and offer people the opportunity to examine it. Mm -hmm. um, so give us an example. Let's say I go into a barber shop. That's an encounter mm. um, I I have. But or is that you create a barber shop and then someone walks in by these on act? Tell us a little bit. <laughs> what's your idea? What what's so the difference? Good. What how do you highlight it and how is it a performance? Yeah. That's a good question. So I look, I, I so when I say that the book is kind of um, both a kind of culmination of the work I've done and a departure from it, uh, I, what I mean is, I suppose that so my work as an artist over the last 10, 15 years has taken lots and lots of different forms. And for a long time, I, I w kind of wondered what what the hell I was doing with my life. Like I was sort of doing these very, what felt like very disparate things. So for a while I was making uh, kind of street games and of these, these kind of games for adults to play out on the streets of their cities. Um, Tell us a game. Happened. What game did so you So I, I created a game called Checkpoint. That was probably the one that was most popular and that people ended up making versions of that all over the all over the world. And the aim of that game was that um, I, I would build a living room installation on one in one area. And then all the players of the game would have to smuggle that, deconstruct that living room and smuggle it piece by piece past a team of border guards, like paid performers, um, and reconstruct it on the other other side of this, the, the area where the game is being played. So for example, if the game was being played in a, in a city square, it might be that the installation is hidden on one side street and you have to deconstruct it and smuggle it piece by piece across the square and reconstruct it on another side street on the other side. And the, the game, so the way to play the game was to appear as if you weren't playing the game, was to look like just an ordinary, um citizen using this public square to not draw attention not to to in order to not draw attention of the um the border guards who couldn't stop everybody because that would be rude and um and so they were on the lookout for people who looked like that they were participating in this game and the players were trying to do their best to conceal themselves within the kind of everyday fabric of that that public place's life um, Around this time, I was very interested in the idea of ordinary people playing ordinary people. So, you know, doing these ordinary actions, but with a kind of reflexiveness, with a kind of um, that maybe made you question the kind of the, the everyday and question the way in which you kind of normally move through those spaces unthinkingly. Um, and so that was a that was a sort of fun game for people to play. And there were lots of very, very creative ways in which people attempted to kind of play this game. And, you know, some of the things that people were trying to smuggle were very small and easy, like, you know, there might be like a dinner plate or something, or there might be like a cup on the sideboard. But then, you know, sometimes there were really bigger things like a whole TV or a, a whole chair, sofa or a carpet that people have then got to figure out a way to try and move without 
drawing attention to themselves and drawing attention to the, their participation in the game. So it was this, the, these kind of, so I started off making these kind of, um, and people bought like, a ticket to participate in it or and um, how did, how did that work? Well, it was often, often this was part of, um, so this was around about the time in the mid 2000s when this kind of sort of urban playfulness was very popular. Um, you know, there was lots of, I think there, there was in New York, there was a group called Improv Everywhere who did these kind of like some, these events that were somewhere between a kind of sort of 60s happening and a kind of prank show prank. Um, there were flash mobs became very popular at this time. And if you remember kind of flash mobs mm -hmm. where lots of people would kind of alight on a public square and all like freeze or all do like a big pillow fight or something. So there was something in the air at that time around this idea of um, reconnecting us with a playfulness in, in, in relation to the way that we use public space, that maybe public space had become too, too pedestrian, too, too, um, too limited in, in how we used it. But um, uh, so a lot of that work I, I was doing with a company in the UK called Hide and Seek, which was run by a, a wonderful man called Alex Fleetwood uh, and, a, and, a, and a brilliant uh, game designer called Holly Gramazio. And um, they ran this wonderful project called Hide and Seek. And they, they would kind of, you know, commission people like me to make these kind of street games. And then people would just turn up and, and get to play them for free, basically. Um, and then quite often the rules of these games would be kind of shared online. And that's often how you ended up finding out that some group of students in California had kind of river, like read about this game online and they decided to do their own version of it on the other side of the world. So it was very kind of very friendly, creative commonsy, you know, the sharing of of games and rule sets all, all over the place and and often you know yeah usually so, free well, why is that more interesting to you than let's say to direct a play by uh harold pinter Stoppard, yeah. carol churchill uh, that's a good question uh so uh, on one level i think for me at the time i was very young at the time so i'm 39 now so i'm talking about you know when i was in my early to mid 20s when I was um, starting to do this. And partly it was because no one was inviting me to come and direct a play in their theatre. Um, so but I think, but, you know, in part, it's the kind of expediency of, um, you know, where are you being invited to do things? And, I, you know, it, it was much easier to, to gain uh, invitations to make things happen on sidewalks and in cafes and in, um, you know, public spaces than it was to, you know, all of the kind of infrastructure and the resources and support that were required to, to, to make a, to make a theater show happen. But uh, for, I mean, in relation to that, there's a company that, that I've worked with a lot in the UK called Action Hero, truly, truly wonderful company who is still going today. Their first show, the first very successful show, was a show called A Western, where they recreated a cowboy Western movie in a, in a cafe. And um, the reason, you know, and, and this, the reason that they decided to do it in a cafe, in a theater cafe, was because no one was inviting them to use the, the, the actual theater auditorium. So they thought if they make a show for the cafe, every theater has a cafe, and maybe everyone will want to program them. And then they were, had the opportunity to kind of that that resourcefulness became part of the um, part of the grammar of their work, part of the way that they they made things, and they actually toured that show all over the world. I think they may have even put it to sort of under the radar, but it's certainly been been in the U.S. before that show, um, and all of that came about through this moment of resourcefulness. So for me, partly it was that, partly it was. It was a certain resourcefulness, wanting to make art, wanting to make performance, but but not necessarily having the the means or the access. But also, I think that I had grown increasingly drawn to the idea of work that was participatory, work that was interactive. I was very excited by things that invited the audience to have a greater degree of physical agency in the work. The thing that really excited me about these games 
was the degree of not just kind of freedom to move around that you do in, say, site-specific work or in immersive work, but was the freedom to be co-creators of the experience through, you know, by providing this, this rule set rather than a script or, or anything else, you are simply kind of creating the space for the, the audience members themselves to be creative, to, to, to be really co-creators of that, of that experience. And that at the time was, was very exciting to me. I was also studying for a PhD and a lot of my PhD was looking at the work of people like Alan Kapral mm -hmm. and thinking about, you know, happenings and uh, event scores, George Brecht and people like that. And, you know, I, I was very drawn to the idea of creating these kind of simple structures, these simple spaces, these simple environments and habitats where, where people are invited to, to, to be creative and to renegotiate their relationship to each other and the world around them. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah, there's a great addition, as you said, you know, coming out of New York's um, avant-garde uh, in, in, in the early half of the second half of the 20th century, the Karpov uh, and, uh, and and so so many others, the Cage um, ideas and uh, mm -hmm. Goffman's, uh, you know, uh, uh, performing in everyday uh, 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 connections and others. And it's an important, I think, uh, contribution that, uh, that made us aware of um, what in visual arts has been uh, a common new approach, you know, to work and in theater or performance, you know, it's still in some way often to this Italian idea, the Italian theater that comes from the 17th century. Um, mm -hmm. You do find it more interesting? Is it more um, uh, alive for you than a production production? Yeah. Um, just to come back very briefly, my, my, one of the things with my PhD was about precisely that, was about saying that this, so much of that work, that work coming out of New York in the 60s and 70s had been kind of its legacy, its cultural memory was stored in galleries. And so it was this very visually orientated form of memory, largely taken the form of photographs and videos and things like that. And my PhD, one of the things I was trying to do in that was to say, is there a different form of cultural memory that we can have of this work? that recenters the performance, performance itself, and recenters the liveness of this encounter between audience and, and performer. Anyway, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a tangent. Do I think, I, I mean, so for me, there is, there, I've always been very excited about the moment where a theater show turns into an event, I suppose. And, and I um, when I used to teach at Royal Holloway in London, I, I created a course that was called Unrepeatable Performances. And I would always start by saying to the students, you know, do you remember a time in the theatre when something went wrong? And almost invariably, everyone remembers a time that something went wrong um, and and they remember it with this incredible clarity and I one of my formative theater memories when I was first a student and I was first learning to love theater was uh, seeing a production by out of out of joint um, theater company Max Stafford Park's theater company they did a production of Macbeth and it was in these sort of subterranean rooms underneath Edinburgh, uh, where I was studying. And this was, a, it was an incredible production of Macbeth. It was this kind of um, voodoo-themed Macbeth, I think, kind of this, um, uh, the, it is this um, uh, yeah, it was brilliant. Um, but towards the end of the performance, all the lights in the theater went out. They were, the, the performance was taking place in these kind of subterranean spaces beneath the Royal Mile in Edinburgh. And all the lights went out and like a power cut. And um, immediately the actors ran around, the, 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 the 
production team got torches and sort of trying to light things with torches. Suddenly someone found all these candles from nearby and they stuck candles out and it all got lit, illuminated by candles. The actors carried on. They made like a few sort of side references to it that made everybody laugh and struggled on through until a, a stage manager came and, and said, uh, we have to stop because it's not safe because this, the fire exit signs have also gone out. So we have to finish. And the actors broke character and they looked kind of disappointed because they struggled on valiantly. And um, we all kind of gave them a big clap. And then as we were clapping, all the lights came back on again suddenly. And everyone looked around and they didn't know what to do. The actors didn't know what to do. The the the, the, the Step, the director didn't know what to do. They, they went and had a quick conference out in the hallway. And then they came back and said, okay, we're going to rewind one scene and we're going to carry on from there. And that, that, that final section um, of the show was, there was some, some quality that it had, some quality that of, of intimacy, of the bond that we now shared, having seen these, these performers breaking in and out of character, having us all navigated this sort of messiness of this journey together and then returning to the drama, to the theatre, to the make-believe, it was absolutely charged. It was like no other, and maybe it was also partly the, the, the space that we were in, but it was like nothing else I'd ever experienced in a theatre. It was phenomenal. And at the end, they had this incredible drumming sort of sequence at the end, and it was the whole space was vibrating. And I remember the biggest round of applause at the end and the, the actors also looked absolutely delighted. And, and it was that thing, and, and uh, Tim Mitchell's wonderful Tim Mitchell's from Forced Entertainment has talked about this, that moment when the theater turns into an event and nobody's quite sure where it's going. And that is, is there's something thrilling about that. There's something truly uh, exciting and potentially dangerous and uncertain and transformative about that. And it feels like it really, um, it, 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 where the boundaries between the real and the make-believe begin to kind of bleed into each other and the theatre's transformative power seems to have the potential to kind of wreak havoc in the real world. And that was what excited me, I suppose. That's what excited me and that's what still excites me. And I think for, for a while, I kind of drifted further and further into saying where into this idea of blurring the real and the everyday and art and life, as as, um, as Alan Caprao said, and um, and yeah, so uh, you know, for for a while, that was that was that was the that was the thing that that, that truly excited me. And you know, I, I've made a journey back as a as a viewer, as a watcher. Uh, I've made the journey back, and now I you know I'll go and see a a traditional theatre show and and sit there quite. Well, quite happily want to sit in the audience and have absolutely no involvement uh, and love it. I, I recently saw the Oklahoma that came over from the US to yeah, the UK. Fisher, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. uh, and it was, I loved it. It was wonderful. It was wonderful. And, and you know, I think maybe now I, I have a slightly more nuanced sense of theatre's power and the power of the power of being and how active you can be as a spectator. I think when I was younger, I would maybe be quite dismissive of what it meant to sit in the dark in silence and do nothing. And I think maybe that was a certain, um, maybe uh, childishness, <laughs> you know, or the, 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 the impetuousness of the, of the kind of fresh convert. <laughs> but um, now I think, you know, there are lots of different forms that kind of agency and activity and active listening can take. Um, but yeah. yeah, I think that's where I that's where I was drawn to that kind of work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we just talked to Eugenio Barba, the great Barba, last week, and he did say it's all about multiplicity. You know, you have things next to each other. It's never about this or that, right or wrong. Black yeah. or white. He says your know, things exist next to each other, and um, and like in a museum where you see artwork from different centuries, you know, next to each other, and it works. You know, and there's a lot of admiration, inspiration. It's all um, movement. So in a way, you. Um, mix your experience as a city watcher as a city dweller as a um as a performer 
um, and uh, to create some kind of a hyper real sense of the reality we live in. I mean, there are big theories. It's all a simulation, you know, and uh, anyway, so you're trying to look at the matrix uh, and play with it. Um, you say you like these kind of um, uh, creative connections and you, you wrote, you know, walking hand in hand with strangers, knocking on doors, staging encounters in parked cars. So tell us a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, I, I, as, I, as I said, I, I've always had a, a sort of fascination with the idea of offering um, offering ordinary people the opportunity to pretend to be ordinary people, to create that, that sort of, um, that frisson of performativity within our everyday lives that enables us to, to kind of pay attention to, play closer attention to, to the everyday. Um, I, you mentioned John Cage earlier on, and he's been a big um, source of inspiration, I suppose. And that, that um, you know, that, the, that thing that he's doing in the silent piece in 433, which is not about silence at all, really, but is about listening and is about listening to the world with the concentration we normally give to music. And, and I've always liked the idea. Just to of say the, for the audience members who don't know, it's like a maybe a concert piece, right? And the orchestra yeah. sits fully and doesn't perform. Tell, yeah. Yeah, so, so 433 is, 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 is uh, I, I think, one of the, maybe the most important, uh, maybe the most important artwork of the 20th century. I'm going to be really bold and I'm going to say that. Uh, I don't know if that's true, but why not say it? Uh, it may be the most important for me, at least. Um, 433 is a piece in three parts um, where uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a musical composition in which there is no playing. So um, at the beginning of, and I make sure I get this right, it's four minutes and 33 seconds of, of silence, or that's what it's described as. Um, the, the concert pianist um, at the beginning of each movement just closes the lid of the piano and waits for the correct length of time. And then at the end of that section, it stops and then it begins again. It, it's, uh, people call it the silent piece, but as I said, I don't think that Cage never intended it to be experienced in kind of solemn silence. Um, and um, he, yeah, I, I, I think that there's some, someone once asked him, for example, about listening to four minutes, 4.33 on a record player. Like, what does it mean to listen? Can, can you have a recording of it, um, of silence? And he said, well, yes as long as you recognize that all the sounds between the speaker of the record, the speaker of the record player and your own ear are now also part of the composition. Um, so, you know, it was, it's part of his, his, you know, his movement into sort of chance and uncertainty and sort of composing with the, the composing with the ears of the audience, I suppose, is what, is what he's doing there. Um, mm -hmm. or inviting you to like listen to sure, the kind sure. of concentration. But um, you say listen, but also create encounters. So tell us a little bit, what do you, yeah. how does it work um, with the dog walker chats or two videos or what, what all that yeah. stuff? Tell us a little oh, bit so what you do. So, it's, a good, so, so to, 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 I, it's probably worth at this point separating out the book from my mm -hmm. yeah. art making. Um, so yeah, to come back to what I was saying right at the beginning. Um, so the book is a combination in some ways in that like all the work that I've been doing has been thinking about encounters, thinking about everyday experiences mm -hmm. um, and this, uh, but always or usually in the realm of art, in the realm of theatre. Um, and I can, I'll, I'll talk about one example of that in just a second when you mention encounters in park cars. Um, but the book itself, this book, Mm -hmm. is actually in some ways the complete opposite of that. So rather than being about constructed events, constructed performances that, that mimic everyday life or that borrow from everyday life, the book is using this kind of lens that I hope that I've um, honed over the, the last little while to look at 
are to look at ordinary life, basically. So the things that I'm describing in the book are not created events. They're not art pieces. They are just normal everyday encounters. So whether it be um, going to get one's hair cut or going for a walk in the park or uh, going to the movies or going clubbing in a, in, a, in a nightclub. What I'm doing is trying to pay attention to and write about and just sort of deconstruct those events with the kind of care and um, uh, with the kind of care that I would normally use when I'm writing about or thinking about um, uh, live performance or theater. So um, there's a chapter, for example, about the first chapter in the book is about get, getting your hair cut, going to get a haircut. And in it, I describe myself going to get a haircut, like an actual haircut that I got from my wonderful hairdresser, Susanna. And through writing about that haircut, I'm also trying to sort of disentangle the, uh, the history of, of hairdressing and haircutting and the role that this encounter has played in our society, in our lives, the role it continues to play today in different communities, the role of African-American barber shops, the role of, you know, the, the myths that we connect with hair cutting from Samson and Delilah to the epic of Gilgamesh. Um, so sort of trying to, as I said, take something very ordinary, very banal, a, a haircut, and think about it in this kind of expanded way and think about everything that it means to us and, and might mean to us in the hope that the next time that the reader goes for a haircut, they might sort of pay a little bit closer attention to what's happening and might appreciate it or value it in a way that they haven't before, that, you know, in, in a way that maybe we've sometimes taken some of these encounters for, for granted. So that's, that's the, that's the, um, that's the aim of the book. The Maybe book read is, us a bit. Read us a bit. You guys. Now you have some yeah, uh, things prepared. Sure. Yeah, I can read you a bit from that that chapter actually. So this is the chapter about uh, this is the chapter about getting your hair cut. So um, it says uh, the first time a hairdresser washed my hair, I thought she might be playing some kind of trick on me. I was 20 years old in a proper hairdresser's rather than a barbershop for possibly the first time. The hairdresser left me at the back of the room with a hot towel over my face. And all I could think was that everyone else in the salon, customers and staff alike, was looking over and laughing. Such care, some people might dismissively call it pampering, was uncomfortable to me because I was so unused to it. I was used to having my hair cut in a room where the boxer Rocky Marciano picture of him was always there to reassure me that nothing unmanly was about to take place. Now I think nothing of the fact that my hairdresser Susanna finishes washing my hair by massaging my head, the tips of her fingers moving in small circles across my skull. How I love this part now, this pampering, this little anachronism, this gentle vestige of a time when the person who cut your hair might also treat the rest of your ailments, lance your boils, bleed you if you needed it. Throughout history and across cultures, haircutting has been a service that people at all levels of society could access, which meant that for many people, the care you received there was often the only kind of care available to you outside of your immediate family. The link between hairdressers and surgery goes back nearly a thousand years. In 1215, the Roman Catholic Church decreed that it was inappropriate for monks to perform any kind of surgery. And so across Europe, their knowledge and their tools were transferred to local barbers who were considered the most suitable people for this new role, given their familiarity with razor blades and scissors. For the following 500 years, in Europe at least, most of the medical treatments available to ordinary people were performed by barbers. At a time when learned medical professionals were limited to courts and universities, they provided the closest thing that most ordinary people could get to a regular medical care. In China, too, traditional street barbers performed essential medical procedures, traveling from town to town, ringing a bell to announce their arrival. So that, that's mm -hmm. just a, 
I, well, I, I, there's a there's a longer section, but I don't, I, I'm, it's more interesting to to talk with you. But that you get a sense of the kind of project of the book, which is to kind of to take these 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 real human encounters and to analyze them with the kind of sort of careful focus that perhaps in the past I have analyzed uh, theater shows and art performances. Mm -hmm. So you're asking us to say, you know, you look your, your lens, if you sit in the dark rooms of theater and you see that the theater on stage, the movements, the light, uh, the objects, so use that uh, uh, skill, that set, what you have, what we've been trained to uh, really be in a Zen-like in the moment and to experience an encounter um, that uh, reflects the theater of life in a way. There's the, um, uh, the, the, the stage, you know, of life's of life's uh, stage. Um, yeah, that's a really nice way of putting it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think Yogi Berra, the great New York baseball player, um, said, you know, you can uh, observe a lot by watching. You know, he said, and uh, <laughs> um, so do. Do you think is it kind of a socially engaged art? Is it a political action? What you ask us to do? Um, that's uh, that's an interesting question. Um, I guess, um, I, th I think that there is certainly a political dimension to the quality of compassion, which is what the book's, I suppose, primary theme is, that perhaps these encounters that we have that often take place across these, these live in-person encounters that often take place uh, are often uh, the opportunities that we have to encounter difference, people different to ourselves and experiences other to us and our, 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 our experience of life, that, that, that having those kind of encounters, that encountering difference in that sense and through that encounter, um hopefully generating greater compassion and empathy for people different to ourselves and for people in general i suppose that is that is to an extent it's a political project and it is a socially engaged project yes but um uh but it i it, if it is it's a very um, it's a it's a it's an open one, I suppose. Um, I I write this book. Um, I suppose, as I said, I, I write this book as someone who has spent fifteen years as a performance maker and as an artist, not as someone who spent fifteen years as a social anthropologist or as a, a kind of um you know activist for the importance of urban space and there are all these you know wonderful people who who do profoundly important things in this in the sphere of um you know social change and the the book is not that but it is hopefully a a you know um a small contribution to a kind of a small contribution and invitation for us to think about how we as individuals position ourselves in relation to the world around us and to the people around us, especially those of us who, who live in, in cities, um, mm -hmm. in those kind of crucibles where, you know, as, as Stuart Hall said you know cities condense difference they are these crucibles of difference um in which people of very different economic status very different backgrounds cultural backgrounds are all in in these very kind of dense and condensed ways and that creates a lot of friction it creates a lot of problems um but it also creates a lot of opportunity i, I hope it creates opportunity for compassion for empathy for understanding for for, for for connection and the book is in its own small way an attempt to improve our 
or enhance our ability to empathize and to connect through playing, through taking care over the way that we are encountering them. Oh, interesting. And in a way, how radical, you know, if you look at the history of theater, it started with the gods, you know, we had the Greek gods, then it were the kings, Shakespeare's kings, then it was, you know, military leaders of the Goethe and Schiller place, and then uh, perhaps it became the merchant class, then in the Moliere place, slowly the servants came up, came and, up someone, and someone... Um, someone said, um, now it's teenagers um, uh, are on the stages. Um, Rimini Protocol, the great German company who said, we're mm. going to show the work of the experts of everyday life. So they ask people to participate. You know, she, she, pop, uh, uh, does that too. They bring them on stage. And, um, and you, in a way, uh, create a new form after what street theater did, the Brett and Puppet Theater, they said, we don't need a big stage behind us. The street is our scenery. You know, we don't need mm -hmm. stage lights. We have sunlight. Um, and we perform there. And uh, But you say an ordinary interaction in itself, when observed right, or in the right mind, um, can do a work that perhaps a theater play does, or what we hope a theater play it does Timo Seagal, of course, in museums and also yeah. does that when he has talks, he says the, the talk is more important than what you see at the wall, the interaction. Um, so it's a radical idea that you say, what if I quote you, if I understood it right, that uh, everyday people, ordinary people perform themselves in ordinary everyday things without performing, perhaps even without being aware of it. But if you observe it, if you uh, are in that moment, if you are uh, uh, a wish that it can be as enriching as the significant and why I like it is you know it's a great Tanya Bruguera said why do we go to the castles of Versailles where the kings lived who were killers who were colonialists you know was done on the blood of slaves in the Caribbean and we observe it you know she said why don't we go into the houses we live in a democracy what, what people's lives people's ideas are as important next to it at least and I think yours is a, a contribution um, 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 towards it. By, so uh, give us another example where you said, this was a moment when I realized that. What did, what did, what did you yeah. what, did, what is there a moment when you said, that now I think this is, I'm gonna write a book about it. What was that <laughs> moment? Yeah, just to come back again. It's yeah. interesting you say we began with the gods. Um, I, I wish I could remember who it is. I think it was a speech by Jeremy Miller. Um, but anyway, there's a wonderful cabaret artist called Dickie Bow in the UK who has a show on, if anyone is in the UK at the mm -hmm. moment, has a show at the Hampstead Theatre called Remember Me, which is a truly wonderful show. He's a lip syncer. He's the, maybe the most miraculous lip syncer that you've ever seen, and he makes these wonderful shows. He, he made, a, he made a, a, a video once that was a lip syncing of a speech, and I think it was by Jeremy Miller, but that could be completely wrong, where he talks about ancient Greece and says that, you know, the theater was the accompaniment to the, the um, uh, you, you know, the, the, the forum where the, the, you know, the ancient Greeks would gather to, dis, you know, to discuss democracy. But obviously, famously, the only people that really participated in Athenian democracy were the, were the, were the men, the, the you know. Also the, soldiers, yeah, coming back from yeah. war, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but in the theatre, those people went to listen, and the people that they were often listening to were women and slaves. They may not have been played by those people, but the voices that were summoned through the theatre were both the voices of Dionysus, but they were also the voices of, you know, they were voices of women, they were voices of slaves, they were voices of servants, who are, and that actually from the very beginning, perhaps, Theatre has also played this role of inviting people to listen to the ordinary, listen to the everyday as part of the necessary and inherent work of democracy. But anyway, that was just a mm -hmm. thought that popped into my head. Um, but yeah, another another instance of when I, 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 I thought about this, I mean, I, I was also thinking as you were talking there and listing off all those people who have, yes, absolutely have been enormous influences in, in my life. Rimini Protocol, um, 100%. In fact, I mentioned Rimini in this book. Uh, there's a section talking about telephone calls, and I mentioned the Calcutta 
in a box and talk about mm-hmm. that uh, piece there. Um, another, but that, as you were as you were talking, I, I was just thinking about um, a, a really important thing. I think for me was it was again the work of forced entertainment has been really important. Um, the, the the a piece that they made, which maybe was the most important piece in, of art in my life that I never got to see. <laughs> Um, uh, was a show called Nights in This City, which they made in 1997, uh, which I was, I was, um, and now I was 13 years old in 1997 and I was not living in Sheffield. So I didn't get to see this particular piece, but it, it's kind of haunted. It, it, I think everything that I've done since I read about it the first time has been in some ways a kind of attempt to recreate the idea of that piece that I had in my tell head. about the idea. Tell about the piece. Tell us. So the piece "Nights in the City" is a is a, was a coach tour through the streets of Sheffield. Um, so you literally you got on a bus, you got on a coach, and they drove you through the streets of Sheffield um, with a tour guide. The tour guide seemed to be kind of drunk and a bit lost, and uh, they're kind of describing what you see in front of you, but they're also describing something else, and uh, it's this sort of beautiful idea that there's in them in this in the forced entertainment book certain fragments this one in this book there's a they they they, tim writes about this show nights in this city and he said something that's always really stuck with me which is like um sometimes well i'll just leave it there sometimes all you need to do is point out of the window or gesture out of the window and invite people to look and that in itself is is enough that that is the that is the performance that invitation to look is enough um and i think that's been that just that one sentence has held such value for me in in my life in fact a, a piece the, the the maybe the the piece of work that i've done the most often um is a show called Lookout, which my partner Becky and I make and have done now versions of maybe 20 or 30 times in different parts of the world. Um, and that piece is just, um, we collaborate with a group of local children, nine or 10 year old children. And the performance is just happens, it's called Lookout. And the performance just happens somewhere high up on a rooftop or a hill or um, some building overlooking the city. And uh, it's a one-to-one performance between one adult audience member and one child performer. And together they look, they simply look out at the city together and listen to these recordings that the children have made describing how they think that view will look differently in the future. Um, And then they have a conversation together. And that's all there is to it, really. It's a conversation informed by this view and informed by this idea of the future. Um, and yeah, that I think all of that, that the, the, the seed of that idea, that seed of that performance and the seed of so much of what this book tries to do and what I try and do in my work is that, that one line from Tim about the importance of sometimes, not of telling people what to think or you know, telling them what they're looking at, but simply inviting people to look and inviting people to pay pay a close attention that perhaps they wouldn't otherwise. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's quite quite something. The complexity of it is that simplicity, um, that Zen-like um, a call for being in the moment attentive and what you say, compassion and care and uh, it is stunning to think, you know, that uh, theater companies with 20, 30 members come on airplanes and tickets and what days lights will set up and uh, uh, to create that encounter. But you say, well, if you pay attention enough, it could happen um, on your coffee shop. It could be in the subway. Uh, it could be in a car, a conversation. Um, um, and that is ultimately, as Peter Brook said, you know, what is theater ultimately? You know, one person shows something for someone else in a room. That's it. That's the minimum of it. And, and everything else, you know, is a, a larger version of, of, of that encounter. And that really what it is, it's movement and encounter. Uh, that's actually what life defines 
and um and um and so you know it's a, it's a big thing to think about especially for us also we think about how does in that new times we live in how does theater work performance work how do we experience a city how do we celebrate it how do we connect to the people who live in it so there is something um, of real um, significance in your work in your um discoveries um I, I just for me to know that forest fringe idea um is that connected already to to this yeah. encounterism is there something in it tell us a bit the festival became well known but i don't know enough yeah about it. so um again I, I think that comes all the way back to the, the the roots of forest fringe go all the way back to uh what i was saying earlier on about that 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 desire to find, you know, that that kind of youthful desire to find sort of opportunities for yourself and your your friends when when it's so hard to do so, you know, when when the um, when the funding is tight and when um, there are not many spaces open to you. Um, Forest Fringe was actually started by my wonderful friend Deborah Pearson in 2007 so uh in 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 2000 De deborah and i have known each other for many years um all the way back to college in canada and we went to, to to a college in canada together um but we in in around 2007 we were both kind of finishing up mas in london and struggling to find opportunities to present the kind of theater that we wanted to to, to present at that time um and this opportunity arose um deborah used to um when we lived in edinburgh deborah used to volunteer at this anarchist uh, anarchist vegetarian cafe called the forest cafe which was a legendary institution in edinburgh this kind of wonderful um chaotic um truly um hopeful and radical institution that used to run a cafe and used to do events. And it was, uh, you know, you could do anything there if you wanted to do it. And if you could, you know, if you could persuade enough people to kind of join you in doing it. And they had this cafe in the middle of Edinburgh and they had this wonderful, beautiful, dusty old church hall above the cafe that they had access to as an event space. And every summer, the Edinburgh Festival would arrive in town. And I say arrive in town because it was by and large run by big companies from London who had very little to do with the city of Edinburgh for the rest of the year. So the, the festival would arrive with, um, you know, this huge scale and very, very kind of commercial festival. And they didn't really know what to do with this festival suddenly appearing around them every August. And so they invited Deborah because they knew she was a, a theatre maker. They invited her to come and run a, uh, a programme of events in, the, in this event space during the Fringe as a kind of, uh, well, we, we, we ended up often being called like the Fringe of the Fringe. So it was sort of, um, we weren't an official part of the Edinburgh Fringe, but, you know, we were doing events they were completely free. Anyone could come along. Um, and in that first year in 2007, Deborah invited a range of her friends and other people from the cafe itself to come and do, do events in this space to try something out for new. Um, they could do it completely for free, which was very rare in Edinburgh. And they could do it for just one, one night if they wanted or one, one, a one-off event. And I, came up and did 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 something did a little performance actually again so this, it all comes back the event that i did was an event called exposures which was a little kind of photo treasure hunt around the city <clears throat> which was again deeply deeply influenced by that same performance the nights in the city by forced entertainment so when forced entertainment went to rotterdam with that show they created this series of questions to ask people as a way of learning about the city and that became the, the, <clears throat> the inspiration for this show that I made oh. at the Forest Fringe in, in the first ever year. And it was a, it was a success. It went really well, the, 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 the Forest Fringe in that first year in 2007. There was, and Deborah and I could really sense that there was real potential in this. There was a need for a venue 
that was at the Edinburgh Festival was operating completely differently to the commercial imperative of the most of the rest of that festival that was doing something, um, experimenting with new forms that was, you know, um, much more kind of DIY and, and, um, and so forth. Um, so in the, the following year, 2008, um, the Forest Cafe invited Deborah to come back and do the program again. And she invited me to come and be a co-director with her. And I was working at a, a popular theatre in London at the time called Bassey Art Centre. And so we got, I managed to persuade them to give us a small amount of funding that helped us pay for some accommodation and a printed programme. And from that moment on, it just grew and grew more than Deborah and I could ever have imagined. So over the course of, we ran that venue in Edinburgh for 10 years. After a few years, another friend of ours, uh, Ira Brand, a German artist called Ira Brand, she, she joined us and she became a third co-director. We moved venue for, to a larger venue, um, uh, a drill hall on the edge of Leith. And um, yeah, it, over time, what kind of consolidated around this kind of scrappy, not-for-profit, free experimental space was a community I think more than anything else a community of young enthusiastic performance makers in the UK who were trying to make more yeah a, a different kind of performance work and um that was people like Action Hero who I who are a company I mentioned earlier on uh an artist called Tanya El Khuri who is now running um the center for civil rights at bard college in, in in upstate new york is an incredible artist who's gone on to have enormous success all over the world she started off she was a just a, a recently graduated ma student who yeah, she was on a seagull talk here actually she was here yeah we oh, had right. her with, with gideon lester yeah mm -hmm. yeah so she she um she she just finished her ma in london she emailed deborah and i at the blue and was like can i come and do something at your venue and we said, yes, of course you can. Yeah, you, we'd love to have you. You sound great. And um, so she came up uh, about two days before she was due to do <clears throat> a show. She said, actually, I want to do something completely different. I want to use a room downstairs in the basement. And I want to do this show that is about the breakup of my relationship and where I get the audience to be the counselor in a relationship counseling session. And it was uh, it was fantastic, and it was something. But that was the kind of spirit of Forest Fringe at the time. Was like you, we are trying to provide this space. We're trying to host this space for artists to use in whatever way suits them, and for them to be able to have the opportunity to take risks in an environment like Edinburgh, where there's lots of potential. There's lots of economic. Economically, it's very expensive, but there's also lots of potential rewards in terms of the number of uh, programmers that are there, the number of journalists, the number of artists you might be able to connect with. So our philosophy was always, if we can try and eliminate the financial risk to the greatest extent possible by providing people with accommodation, providing people with a space for free, providing people with, um, uh, allowing people to do very limited runs, one or two performances rather than a whole month, by eliminating that financial risk, we can encourage people to take much greater artistic risks, and mm -hmm. that that was the that was the spirit of that that place, and it was it was a it was a really exciting thing to do, and I think that um, a lot of uh, I met Tim Etchells and the, the wonderful people from Forced Entertainment through that. They were big supporters from early on. Tim did a number of projects with us. Forced Entertainment in the end came up and did Quizula with us as well. Um, in one of the final years. So it, it, it was very formative for Deborah and I, mm -hmm. I think, running that venue. It, we made so many friends, but we also learned so much from our peers through observing them, supporting them to, to <clears throat> kind of take risks and, and present, present mm -hmm. work in, it, in a different way. It, it, it is one more reason also to look closely at your book and of your suggestions. You know, it comes out of a long experience with the artists, very serious artists, uh, and to say, you know, this is perhaps something we should focus on, we should think about. Um, what comes to my mind, David Levine, a great 
New York theater performance artist or theater artist, he once created a painting of Monet in the Central Park. He kind of put the people and costumes as on the painting, but didn't tell anyone. You know, so people would just pass by, you know, and um, and see, um, and um, and uh, and and see that. And I think uh, for you to uh, highlight us, I think I once saw a book from architects. Uh, they said, you know, it, <clears throat> normally they're city guides, but to go, what museum and what buildings? And they would say, go to the Upper West Side, 86th Street, to the playground, and see where the nannies who are hired from Latin America take care of kids, you know, from people who live there. Watch that. Go to uh, the Grand Central train uh, station when the last trains leave every evening one or two people will miss their train and have a tantrum and throw their briefcases on the floor because it means they have to spend a night in the hotel or pay $250 for a taxi you know and um, mm -hmm. and many things go to a game a baseball what look at the people how they come to a game at their faces what they addressed you know the hope the the atmosphere and um, I think it's a it's a great, uh, a, a great yeah. um, a way to include something in thinking that doesn't come to mind right away when it comes to performance, theater, um, festival ideas. Um, still, I don't want to let you go away with it without telling us a, a, the staged encounters in parked cars. And what was oh, that? Oh, yeah. yeah. So that was uh, one of the, um, that was one of the early shows that, that I made after so as I said, I sort of began by making these games and street games that were, were, were really just sets of instructions, rule sets and such like. Um, and then uh, I got uh, a, a couple of invitations. But basically, when, in my youngest younger years, all of the most important and interesting opportunities that were given to me were from this one sadly now lost theater in Glasgow called The Arches from a, 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 a who used to be run by a woman called Jackie Wiley who now runs the National Theatre of Scotland and by uh, mm -hmm. uh, a programmer called LJ Dodds who now runs a really fantastic um, theater uh, festival in Glasgow called Take Me Somewhere and they were just so so important to both Deborah and myself in terms of the trust they gave us and the opportunities they gave us and uh very early on in my career i think uh, like two, 2000 and 2008 or 2009 something like that um they uh L L lj and jackie were the, the their venue was going to be closed for a while for some renovations and they had some funding to do an off-site season and they said to me we would love you to make something for this off-site season. You can do anything you want, anything you want. It just has to not be in a theatre. And I was uh, initially, uh, that was too much. <laughs> it was, I, I quite liked to be in situations where you are able to kind of respond to a sort of set of um, limitations or the, you know, the, the particular kind of textures and dimensions of a space. And so this was sort of almost overwhelming. So I thought, well, what, what, how could I, how can I build myself a space, a, a, limit, a set of limitations in a space? And so I, I thought, well, it would be great to try and make a show that happens in a parked car. And so I made this piece. Uh, and I've always loved, like, uh, for my sins, I've always loved cars since I was a little kid. Um, which I know is a bad thing to confess to because they're so awful in so many ways and have done such damage to <laughs> the, the world. But I just always loved them. I loved the, I, I love driving. I love being driven around. When I was very little, my mom would just drive me around to get me to sleep. Uh, I, I love the excitement of cars and of racing. I love the association that cars had with the Americana and the you know, this particular version of the American dream, American graffiti and, you know, Cannonball Run and, and all these kind of, you know, this, this kind of as, a, a, associations. And so I, I always loved cars, but I was always fascinated by the extent to which the mythology of the car as it lived in my head through motor races and Steve McQueen and, and uh, you know, whatever else, was at such a far remove from the banal, 
quite depressing, often quite frustrating experience of actually driving around. And that these two things seem to kind of operate almost at a completely dislocated from one another. Um, the myth, the symbolism of the car and the actual lived experience. Um, and so I thought it would be great to make a show in a car that is employing this kind of register of mythos and romance, but within this very, very banal setting. So you're, the, the, the way I sort of decided to do this was through audio. So the, the concept of the piece, the piece was called Motor Vehicle Sundown as a sort of direct allusion to, to the George Brecht piece, Motor Vehicle Sundown. Um, and the idea was that you, the, the idea was that this car was a living museum to the automobile at a time in the far future when cars no longer exist. And as a, as a visitor to this museum, you sit inside the car and you put on a set of headphones and the voice on the headphones describes to you what it must have been like to drive a car. And the descriptions that you hear are these kind of lush, romantic, sort of string-backed rhapsodies on the journey down the open road or the romance at the drive-in movie theater or whatever. Um, and that this experience of what you're being told driving is like in your head is so far removed from sitting in this very boring, very ordinary English, little English car at the top of a multi-story car park in, in Glasgow or wherever else we did it that this was kind of forcing you to kind of reflect on the relationship between the myth, the romance, the, the notion of the, the, the car and the actual physical object and its, and its, uh, its place in, in the world. So that was kind of one element of it. And then the other thing was about it using the kind of constraints of the car it became this little dance that so the audience came in pairs and it became this little dance that took place in in the car so you you would begin together on the back seat of the car and then you'd move together to the front seat of the car and then by the end of the piece one of you is in the front one of you is in the back and so over the course of the piece you the two audience members drift further and further apart and uh they begin to experience the piece in very different ways and what they're hearing in their headphones diverges further and further from each other. So yeah, it was this, um, it was a kind of a little piece of choreography, a little piece of experimental performance, a little experience that you had that was again, I suppose coming, coming back to the, the, the book again, it was about asking you through these kind of through this little choreography through these words that you're listening to in your head through these kind of allusions to the history and romance and and um, and the myth of the of, of the automobile is asking you to pay attention to the act of driving and the act of being in a car in a way that you, you might not normally and we actually yeah. did that that that's um we did this piece we did it in new york this piece at the abrams art center when the, when the lovely Jay Wegman was still there, we set the car up on a street just around the corner from Abron's and um, an audience members got to come and do that. And uh, when we were, when Jay hosted Forest Fringe as doing what we used to call like a micro festival. So we did a little mini version of Forest Fringe over a weekend at Abron's and that car piece was, was part of that. It was part of it. Yeah. Amazing. So, I heard of it. Well, this is fantastic. And the way all of this, even if you say, you know, it's a different reaction to your normal work, the book and your work, it seems connected. Um, it's just for you highlighting, you know, um, a, a new aspect, you know, that perhaps should be paid a much more, um, much more attention to. We are coming, you know, close to the end. Maybe you read us, a, a fa if there is a small finishing piece, what yeah. I would like to share in, as a reflection and, and also for the audiences, as always with Siegel Talk, ultimately it's about you or listeners who are there, you know, how can you, you listen, how can you be in that moment, how can you have an encounterism 
um, on your own and to 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 feel yeah. more alive, to be connected to life, to your city. And um, it's a um, it's a call to all of us. And you can also do it without paying the two hundred dollars that I now ask for to see. I think there's Steppenwolf production <laughs> in Chicago, no student tickets. And uh, so there is something there um, um, for us in that big world we live in, and perhaps closer in a way to democratic yeah. ideas, and also perhaps as you hint to uh, spiritual ideas of what art and theater is about. Yeah, well, interestingly, this, this, this is the chapter that probably comes closest to us sort of trying to explore a, a, a sort of the, the, the spiritual aspect. Uh, this, uh, I'm gonna read one short, it's about three, three or four pages from a section about, um, about night clubbing. So, mm -hmm. Uh, in this chapter, I, I, I break the, 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 the experience of going clubbing down into a series of movements. So the first movement is the journey to the edge of town where the club might be or, or a journey towards an edge. But it might not be the edge of town, but it might be a sense of being far away from your lived reality. The second movement is about the queue, queuing. Uh, a, a later movement is about the joy of the smoking area as this kind of liminal space. And, and the final movement is going home. But this, this, this section is specifically about, is about dancing and about music. So it says, uh, it's called Movement Three, a succession of repetitive beats. Uh, dancing together might be the oldest way we have of not feeling afraid a way of keeping at bay the unknowability of the world and all the dangers it may or may not contain. At the height of the wet season in Gombe National Park in Tanzania, when, when, when raindrops waterfall from the sky, splattering across low-hanging leaves and the forest floor, chimpanzees have been observed to strut and sway along to the sound, striding across the ground in big looping figure eights, matching their own furious energy to that of the weather. Primatologists who study chimpanzees believe that our own human dancing might have evolved from this kind of behavior. Yuko Hattori from Kyoto University, for example, speculates that animals like chimps <laughs> began making rhythmic patterns of sound as a coping mechanism when faced with loud and overwhelming stimuli in the world around them. There is something wonderful about the idea that music and dance may have originated as a way of coping with the often overwhelming experience of simply being in the world a means of reflecting and refashioning all the noise and the chaos, the riot of a thunderstorm, the fury of a stampede, the sudden shock of a rock fall, a way to bundle it all up in sound and dance it into oblivion, dance it into oblivion, dancing until we aren't afraid anymore. And we have been dancing for so long now. We have danced through ice ages and migrations, through droughts and floods and famines, through revolutions, colonizations, we danced through the Black Death and smallpox and cholera. We danced into the machine age when the way we lived was transformed forever by the power of capital. When, as philosopher Simone Weil observed, the oscillations and variations of our natural rhythms were supplanted by the clockwork repetition of industrial time. Now, in our vast modern cities, it is rarely the sound of rainstorms or stampedes that overwhelms us but rather the sound of so many other people driving cars, talking on their phones, shouting, arguing, fighting, working, living right up against one another. More than anything, the thing that we learn to be afraid of is each other, and especially of those people um, identified as different to ourselves, as other. This fear is reinforced in particular in big, densely populated cities where people from different backgrounds and communities live in intimate proximity to one another. Such places are characterized as especially dangerous, hotbeds of violent crime, hostility, and mutual suspicion. This was especially true in the late 1970s and 80s, when in places like Chicago, Manchester, and Detroit, the decline of industry and the hollowing out of the inner city helped foster a conception fueled by prejudice and neglect of urban life as perpetually blighted by criminality and violence. It is no coincidence that such cities were the first places where people, especially those marked as other, including people of color and queer people, came together to create a new music and a new way of dancing together that reflected and refashioned this new reality. That took our paranoid urban isolation and its relentless machine rhythms and made a new kind of machine music uh, to enable them to cope with, cope with it. Yeah. 
the I, I just read one yep. last the 1986 Chicago house song Your Love begins with a simple three note arpeggio synth loop. Tiny pricks of sound descending out of the darkness like rain falling on a still pond. A few seconds later, a drum machine erupts, snare, kick drum, and a barely perceptible hi-hat combined to create a propulsive beat that you feel as a snap in your shoulders. This is followed almost immediately by a sparse bass synth loop that carves itself a hole in your chest and takes up residence there. This song isn't so much moving forward as orbiting, accumulating new textures, new rhythms, new feelings as it does so. Then, at about the one minute mark, a single sustained string note unfurls like a fog bank, wrapping itself around the first three sounds, binding everything together. There are a number of versions of this song, each combining these four elements in a slightly different way, but every one I've heard begins with that initial three note line, looping and looping, insistently, unchangingly, a rippling, repetitive, pulsing beat that cannot be denied. Because the thing you may not notice about your love as it soaks through your skin, is that the initial three note synth line is in a completely different time signature to the rest of the song, meaning it is constantly changing location in relation to the other elements of the track, twisting itself around those repetitive, repetitive machine beats like an act of seduction. In this music, repetition becomes a texture rather than a condition. It bends and dips and unfurls, it pauses and recommences, it moves in wondrous ways and the dancers move along with it. This new machine music transformed the deadening cadence of mechanical repetition into something vibrant, sensuous, and alive. In the ruined cathedrals of our industrial age, in buildings where once thousands of people had performed the same repetitive tasks hour after hour, day after day, in the production of profit for a tiny few, people now gathered to dance in glorious, defiant unproductivity. So I'll just leave it there. There's, there's a bit more to that, but that's probably mm -hmm. enough. For wow, now. The, the new the new machine music and that places, as you said, you know, they were for technical reproduction for a profit of few are now democratically used in an artistic way, creating a community. Well, listen, um, it's been uh, great to listen to you and um, and uh, we'll keep thinking um, about all of it as an important contribution to the field from Andy Field. Um, and um, and really, a congratulation on all the work you have done, the reflection, which one can hear so clearly you know, you have done, have, you have worked hard, you know, to find solutions for a theater, for a performance, for our time, what is meaningful now, not 20, 30, 50, 100 years ago, but really now, or perhaps even, as you hinted at, in the future, you know, what will, will become of significance and importance to cope with what you call to be thrown um, into life. So thank you all. Thanks for how round three uh, um, for uh, supporting us. Uh, join us uh, on Thursday. We have Chia Mann, the great granddaughter of Heinrich Mann and Thomas Mann, um, who created a play about the astronaut or someone reflecting on the Czech Revolution. And go out to Boston. The, I saw the Gaga play. We talked about it before from the Arlequin players, from um, Sasha um, Denisova. Wonderful, interesting uh, place in a bunker underground with uh, professional actors and members from the community on this Putin imagined on trial in an Alice in Wonderland or Alice in a Bunkerland uh, a production. Very interesting. So Andy, thank you so much. I'm so glad we all connected and, um, and yes, everything, everything is connected as you, as you pointed out. Bye-bye. Thank you thank so you. much. Thank you.